let's hit it. And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about. Welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I hope you enjoyed our opening music. It's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring Maya Door. And if you like it, you can go ahead and download it on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to our show, we're about sound information, not just sound bites. We want to raise everyone's voice who's in the field. Those diagnosed, family and friends caring for them, professionals, authors, movie directors, singers, songwriters, advocates, you name it. So if you have a story to share, give me a holler, reach out and be our next guest. Now, before we get into our topic today of deep brain stimulation, which I'm really excited to hear about, I first like to give a couple of shout outs to a few organizations. First is the Memory Cafe directory. There you can find Memory Cafes in five different countries. And uh, Dave has broken out which ones have virtual cafes under Cafe Connect. I happen to host um, a couple of those for Arthur's Senior Living. And we do those on the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month. And you're more than welcome to join us on that. You can go to Memory Cafe directory or you can check with me and I'll be uh, more than glad to give you information on that. I also want to give a shout out to Dementia Map, which is the global resource directory we just developed and launched right before the holidays. It's getting um, great feedback and we encourage people to go there and find wonderful resources. And if you have a resource product tool or information you want to get out, um, reach out to us at DementiaMap.com. I would be glad to give you a personal tour of the site because it offers way more than just a listing. Um, it also has an informational blog and a calendar of events, which I think is going to be really helpful to so many people, um, both families and professionals. And then Coral Health is still allowing people to download two of their um, apps, Music First and Coral Faith. So go to Coral Health, that's C-O-R-O health.com to get more information about that. Now we're going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker and then we're going to be back to talk about deep brain stimulation. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle? to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. Well, welcome back. It's finally time to talk about uh, deep brain stimulation. And I am so excited to have Todd Lab again with us. He is the CEO of Functional Neuromodulation. And he has been in the medical device business for over 30 years, mostly with Medtronic. He joined Functional Neuromodulation in 2012. 
at the very beginning, hoping to make a contribution to the field of Alzheimer's disease. And we're gonna be talking about exactly what they're doing in the trials at hand. Well, Todd, I am just thrilled that you are able to be with us today. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to share your knowledge with us today. Thank you, Lori. Delighted to be here. I'm really, really happy I could, uh, could sit down with you and chat about uh, the company that I'm involved with. And I think what you've done with Alzheimer's Speaks and the other programs you're running, it's, it's really just a great, uh, great accomplishment you've, you've been involved with and happy, happy to be here. Well, thank you. Before we get started with my line of questioning, I always like to ask every guest if they've been personally touched in their own family or circle of friends by dementia. So, yeah, as, as I was getting uh, prepared for, the, for our conversations today, I was reflecting on that, and, and it occurred to me that I've actually been quite lucky that no immediate family members or friends, for that matter, really um, been affected by, by this you know, terrible disease. Um, but my, my, my grandmother, who's since passed away, her, her brother's wife um, had the disease. Uh, unfortunately, she, she lived quite a long time into her 90s. She just passed away this past year. Uh, she was in a, an, assisting, an assisted living facility and contracted COVID, unfortunately. And um, that ultimately um, caused her death. Uh, but that's the closest that's the closest, and I, you know, again, I'm, I say I'm lucky. I know a lot of I know a lot of friends and other people who have been affected, and I, I know the story. So it's a tough, tough disease, but I consider myself lucky in that respect. Very much so, because uh, the the numbers are just spiking, and will probably continue to do so. So we need as much help and support out there with uh, cure or slowing it down, or you know, just settling down the symptoms, even if it's for a short period of time. Uh, people want that and they deserve that. So I'm excited to talk to you about your company, Functional Neuromodulation, and then you also have um, Advance to Trial. And I really want to find out more about that. My understanding is that that has to do with deep brain stimulation. So can you tell us what, what does that mean, you know, <laughs> what, and what does that look like for somebody? Sure, um, so, so deep brain stimulation it's also known as something called DBS, and it involves um, it involves a device like a like a pacemaker. We we like to refer to it as a pacemaker for the brain, and we're using technology that's been um, first developed by a, a company called Medtronic, a large medical device company, and it's been used for many many years for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, and it's very effective for that indication, uh, in fact, and um, uh, roughly 150,000 people so far have received this brain pacemaker for, for primarily Parkinson's disease, but there are other indications that DBS is used for as well. So we're using that technology with, with, without any modifications, really. And the simple difference that between what, how it's used in Parkinson's disease versus how we're using it in Alzheimer's disease is the specific part of the brain that we're, we're stimulating or, or putting electrical current into. So there's a specific site in the brain for, for, for Parkinson's and there's a specific site of the brain that we're using it for Alzheimer's disease. And not surprisingly, we're trying to intervene in the memory circuits in Alzheimer's disease. Interesting. And I found it really interesting because I just interviewed a company called um, Charco Neurotech who is using that for Parkinson's. And so we did an interview the other day on that um, with somebody with, with the disease and I learned so much and it was amazing. So I was really interested in hearing exactly, you know, what you're seeing from your studies and what types of things are you hoping that the stimulation will be able to affect as far as symptoms of Alzheimer's disease? Because there's so many various ones. Yes. So it's a unique approach actually to Alzheimer's. And one of the most common approaches that, 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 that um, the listeners may be aware of is, is treatments that are generally focused at the, the abnormal proteins that are built up uh, mm -hmm. in Alzheimer's disease and, and the cause of those. The plaques and tangles. <laughs> exactly. And, and who knows why, if they're cause and effect if, or, or if they're there because of some other problem in the, in the brain of Alzheimer's patients. But most of the therapies that exist today are really focused on, on that. So the amyloid hy hypothesis, so-called, amyloid proteins and tau proteins. And we've taken a little bit of a different approach 
in that we're trying to uh, approach the, 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 the disease as a circuit-based disease. So the, the, the memory circuits in the brain are pretty well understood. Um, we, we know how they connect to each other generally. And when I say we, I mean the researchers and physicians who treat the disease and study the disease. And there are various nodes in the network that communicate to one another through, through pathways. And um, once one of the, the theory that we're working on is once one of these nodes in the network generate and start to lose function, they may not be able to communicate with the other nodes in the network who are expecting to receive information um, and transmit information. So the idea is once one of the nodes breaks down, it's a cascade of events over time when the other nodes just aren't getting the information they're expecting or, or need to receive. So the idea here is we're taking electrical current and inserting current into the brain to sort of keep the lights on, to keep the power going in the, in the, in the, in the circuit. So that cascade of degeneration is arrested. That's the idea behind what we're trying to accomplish. So we, we hope that we can slow the course of the disease through, through this kind of intervention. So is it inserted into the brain or someplace else in the body? So the system, um, in, in order to, to access this particular network, the electrodes are small wires. And I might say electrode, uh, when I say electrode, I might mean wires, they can be interchangeable. These small wires are inserted into the brain of, of patients with, with Alzheimer's disease. A neurosurgeon does that. And we, we're using neurosurgeons who do this all the time for Parkinson's disease. So their skill and expertise is on this kind of surgery. So they know how to identify the structures in the brain and very precisely insert these electrodes so that they're, um, they're right next to the structures we want to send current to. So the, the electrodes do go into the brain and then the system, they're connected to a pacemaker-like device which is implanted in the chest. If you look at the device, it has a battery in it, it has electronics looks every bit, every bit as much as a, as a pacemaker would look like. So that's why we like to call it as a, as a pacemaker for the brain. Okay, great. I know when I, um, this was years ago and there was something over in the UK and they had like a, a cap that somebody put on, you know, and if they wore this cap for a little while, they said for eight hours or six hours or something that their symptoms would subdue and they were able, you know, their memory was able to come back and executive function and things, if I remember correctly, over time. And so this sounds like it is something that they can have without being noticeable in, in terms of stopping and having to put it on and just get kind of pumped up for a period of time. Right, so that's a really good point. So once, once the device is implanted, it, um, you actually can't tell it's there. So you, you won't see the leads protruding from them under the scalp, the hair grows back, and any incisions that have been made um, will, you know, will be covered up you know, by hair growth. Or in the case you don't have hair growth, these, you, you can't even, you can't see the, the wires that are underneath the scalp. You know, the, the idea here too is that, um, you know, these holes that are inserted, they're, they're quite small. They're holes, um, just enough to fit a wire through. And, um, the thing about the fully implanted device is it's it's on, you know, all the time, so that the brain is continually getting a this this current that we believe is necessary. So it's not as if it gets it's it's intermittent, where you come back once a week and some of these other therapies for 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 four or five weeks or six weeks to do this. So, and we, since since the disease is an ongoing process, we we believe the stimulation needs to maybe needs to be going. Uh, consistent with that process. So the continuous stimulation pattern is what we think is the right approach. So this is going to sound like a silly question, but I'm going to ask it because I don't know. Um, so you, you put some wires in, in the brain and then you have this device on your chest. So is it like a wireless that it communicates or how does that work? Are the, are the wires connected to this device and, and filtered through somehow? Yes. Okay. So it's all connected to each, the wires are connected to what, you know, to the pacemaker and they're tunneled under the skin. Okay. So uh, to the pacemaker. So this is the, again, this is the same procedure we're doing for Parkinson's disease. We're just doing it for a different part of the brain. So, so the surgeons who do this have figured out how to, you know, how to do this safely. 
on effectively. And it's done, um, it's done in the operating room, a surgeon, neurosurgeon's operating room. Um, and some neurosurgeons approach it differently. Some do um, the wires while the, while this, the subject is awake because the, the brain doesn't, doesn't feel uh, pain. I don't know if everybody knows that, but the brain actually it's, itself doesn't feel pain. And then um, when they put the, the pacemaker in, that's done under general anesthesia. And in our clinical trial, um, most patients are discharged the next, you know, within 24 hours, usually the next day after the procedure, which is really important. It's really important. In fact, when we did our first study, and we can talk about the results of that, um, you know, clinical trials are done to, to evaluate new technologies. So we were hoping that uh, patients would tolerate the procedure well, and we were happy to see that in the first study, patients with, with Alzheimer's um, disease actually tolerate the procedure very well. Well, that's fantastic news. Um, now, one of the things, you know, in terms of the study itself, so they actually get this implanted for the study. Who qualifies for that? Because that's one of the biggest complaints people have is like, oh, they want this person and I'm kicked out because I have that. And my guess would be, um, and I could, correct me if I'm wrong, but if somebody has a pacemaker already, maybe they couldn't have two devices like this in the body. I don't know. Um, or would they conflict with one another? Well, um, the answer to that question would be no. So there are ways, you know, the, the, in, in the old... Older, older, older days of, of this kind of technology, especially the pace, pace, pacemaker technology, there, there has been concerns, there were concerns about devices talking to each other and more and more on the pacemaker. But those, there's so many implantable devices of different natures now that the manufacturers have figured out a way to make that a non-issue. Um, but the question on clinical trials, um, it can be frustrating because when you write a protocol for the for the FDA, you have to be very specific about what what makes a patient uh, in, in included in the study. So you have eligibility factors, both inclusion and exclusion factors that you need to identify. And the reason you do that, one is many times it's for safety. You want to make sure people, you know, have the right uh, are good surgical candidates in our case. They don't have other underlying conditions that might preclude them from participating in the study. Um, but you also have um, inclusion criteria to make sure that you know, your hypotheses on, on whom this might work is well controlled. And in our case, we want to be sure that patients have mild dementia, number one, because our, 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 the way we think this works, we want to have something, some electrical circuitry to work with. If, if the nodes in the network, as I mentioned before, are too deteriorated, our hypothesis of keeping the lights on may be too late. So we're trying to intervene early in, in a mild in, in, in patients with mild disease. And um, we also the other key factor here is we'd like um, we'd like patients who uh, are 65 years or older. And the reason for that is that's generally the cutoff between early onset and late onset Alzheimer's disease. And there, there might be a difference in the, bio, the biology of patients with late onset versus early onset disease, where our therapy might likely be better in patients who are at that cutoff of 65 or older. Now, admittedly, 65 is somewhat arbitrary, but it is, it is a cutoff, whether it's 64 or 66, we had to choose a number. And 65 is, is the cutoff that we chose. So greater than 65 with mild disease, and generally, in, in, in good, you know, good health, so that you can you can uh, withstand the surgery. Even though I, I just said you can, it's well tolerated. But some some people are not good surgical candidates for cardiac reasons and those kind of things. So those are the key. We have a we do have a long list. I, I, we're we're guilty of that too. But it's the yeah, nature. Everybody of, does. It's yeah. The nature of clinical research. And one other interesting thing in our study is, I'm, I'm not sure if the listeners. Um, Understand, understand this, but I, I learned this quite on as early on in, in getting involved with a company is that originally Alzheimer's disease can be a difficult diagnosis for, for even people who have done this for a long time. And it can be confusing with what the actual dementia cause is. And so even in the best of hands, the most expert Alzheimer's people can sometimes misdiagnose a patient 
And it's just because it's, you know, medicine is, is difficult and it's a clinical diagnosis and they're confounding factors. So recently they've come up with ways, the research of ways is to look at what are called biomarkers of the disease to help the clinical diagnosis confirmation. So in our study, we're actually take, looking at the cerebral spinal fluid, which is the fluid that bays the, the spinal cord and circulates within the brain. And we're looking at biomarkers of the disease and specific proteins in, in, that, in that fluid, which will help us increase the certainty that patients who enroll in our study really do have Alzheimer's dementia. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting when you were talking about, you know, how the difficulty of diagnosing and a lot of times people are diagnosed with one thing and it switches to another and then some are really lucky and they get multiple types of dementia. So they'll have Lewy body and they'll have, um, you know, something else or Alzheimer's and, and something else. Um, and it, that's been, a, a, you know, frustrating for people, needless to say, uh, who have the disease. Uh, Especially, I remember when they changed uh, a lot of people diagnosed with Alzheimer's. They they told them, "No, now you've got mild cognitive impairment." And they're like, "No, there's nothing mild about this. Nothing, yeah. <laughs> you know." But they knew it was probably more of an insurance adjustment and and uh, rigmarole there than anything else. And and so um, it's it's hard for those who are living with a dementia to know, you know, am I going to qualify? And one of their biggest frustrating. Um, things that they tell me is that, you know, I, I jump through all these hoops and then we don't qualify. And so are there certain things that you list out, like if you have diabetes or if you have a heart condition, then you're just not going to qualify so that people don't jump into the full mode of, of trying to apply? Yes. And the list, the list is uh, very clear before you even before you even uh, you know, sit down with the research coordinator or the, or the physician, we typically have a, you know, a screening process which starts at one level. Are you greater than 65? Um, have you been diagnosed with, with Alzheimer's disease? Um, very, very simple questions. And once those basic high, le high level questions are answered the right way, um, then we go on to the next level. Do you have diabetes? Do you have history of, uh, you know, do you have a brain a history of brain injury? Do you have any cardiovascular disease? All of those types of things we ask. We try to get those out of the way be, because then you don't want to subject somebody to, you know, let's face it, it is rigmarole. There is a lot of work on the patients uh, and caregivers' behalf in these trials to, you know, to, to screen and to qualify. So uh, it's it's quite rigorous. So we don't want to have patients go through that process. If, if they can be told early on that for this particular trial, you may not qualify. Now, that doesn't mean they may not qualify for other trials, but each, each trial is, is unique. Um, and at the very end, I mentioned that cerebral spinal fluid test, that we leave that one till, till the very end um, because it does involve a needle stick. And even though uh, it, it, it's, it, it, it's safe, it's the very final thing. And if everything else fits, I mean, you don't, you don't want to do that up front and say, oh, you do have mild Alzheimer's disease, but then fail on something much simpler. So then they wouldn't have had to undergo that CSF. So we try to stage these things uh, so, that, so that the rigmarole is, you know, we don't have to put patients through those unnecessary procedures unless, unless necessary, uh, obviously. And some of these things too are, um, one of the requirements for the for the mild diagnosis, you have to take some cognitive tests, mm -hmm. and we have ranges for these cognitive tests that are pretty standard in these studies, and um, and we do those we do those pretty early on too because if you fail on those cognitive tests, then you either have too advanced dementia or you have too early dementia, and then you wouldn't qualify. Okay. Yeah, and it's, it's, like I said, people are really excited about trying to participate in a trial, but it, it does wear them down through the process, and yet they all understand the process needs to be there and why it's there. One question I have is you'd mentioned, you know, for the, the kind of the, the brain pacemaker that you um, put in, they have to go under anesthesia. Do you do any um, screening of their tolerance? 
for anesthesia because anesthesia can itself can really be a setback for a lot of people with dementia. It doesn't affect everyone like that, but many that sets them back and they don't always recover to where they once were. So I'm wondering if you're asking any questions regarding, you know, has this been an issue for them in their past? And not that they would recognize it probably with dementia, but um, I'm just kind of curious on that. Yeah, so that's, uh, w w we do, and I'm using the word we in a very general sense. So, so we, leave, we leave those decisions up to the anesthesiologist uh, the patient's neurologist or psychiatrist who's caring for, for, for the individual, and the neurosurgeon. So all of these people work as a team to determine whether or not this, this, this person is a, is a good surgical candidate or not, which includes the anesthesia component uh, you know, of this. And um, the, the, we're very aware of that. Of that. And we, we, in our first trial, which is called Advance 1, uh, we, we studied this technique, this treatment on 42 patients, and we were very interested in the outcome of what the surgical procedure might have on cognition. So we brought everybody back 30 days after the procedure and evaluated everybody uh, to see how they performed on the cognitive tests. And we were very pleased with the findings. We fought, saw no difference between before and after on the patients that we, that we studied. Now, I always like to be cautious when I talk about clinical research. It's 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 42 patients. It's not we didn't do thousands of patients. Um, we, we do talk about um, the procedure with patients before they go they go through uh, they they go through it, and we have an informed consent process, and which involves a lengthy conversation. But we're very happy by that outcome. But I'm glad you raised that because it is an important consideration for for a surgical study like ours, especially in Alzheimer's patients. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, from what I've heard from a lot of people, they're not really always told that this could be a complication for them, you know, no matter what type of surgery that they're having. Um, I've heard that from many people, like no one told us that that was a potential risk factor and, and not that that would change their mind, but again, it's just one of those things nice to know um, just in case something like that would happen. Well, that's, you know, that, um, I think we should emphasize that conversation because, you know, patients need to make, and their caregivers uh, who are considering these studies need to know everything from A to Z about, about what's going on before, what could happen, you know, while they're in the trial, what could happen afterwards. And that process is, 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 is called the informed consent process in, in official clinical trial language. So there, there doc, there's a document that's prepared for, for, for the study that the FDA looks at, um, something called internal research review boards look at to make sure it's saying all the right things, it's fair and balanced. It, it talks about the, the benefits, but also the risk in a, uh, in, 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 a, in a language that you don't have to be a physician to understand. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really, that's a very important part of this process. And, and people can make an informed decision that way. And some people uh, will decide one person's decision to say yes doesn't mean uh, another person needs should say yes or vice versa. It's an individual person's decision along with their caregiver and family. Yeah, and every and every situation is different, you know. Um, and you can't you can't always predict those those outcomes. Um, I'm interested in the process itself. Is there a time? Let's say I go on and I say, hey, I'm interested. How long will it take someone to get back to me to respond? And I know with COVID, that's probably, you know, shook things up and mixed it up a, a little bit there. Um, but what what is the process to get an initial response back? And then also um, just the process itself? That's a really good question. So um, it depends a little bit. So let's say you're, we have several research sites across the United States, one in Canada and several in Germany. And let's say you're already uh, you're already in the Johns Hopkins system. Mm -hmm. So in in that case, it's it it's they already have your medical records. So you can raise your hand and say, I, I think I might be a candidate. Um, you can call the study coordinator, which is listed on the on Hopkins website. It's also on clinicaltrials.gov. It's on our company's website. And you can call the coordinator and say, I'm interested in the study. 
you can reach out to them and they can give you an answer quite quickly, at least on the high level things. Now, first of all, to say, have you been diagnosed? As we mentioned, are you greater than 60? Those kinds of questions they'll ask right away. And if so, they'll say, um, okay, you might be a candidate. And the next step would be, we'd like to um, schedule for you for maybe for a more rigorous conversation on the phone to go through those other details that I mentioned for maybe a half an hour or so. And then after that, if you, after that is done, the most important part to, uh, to the next step is to, to get your medical records because they need to see your medical records. So you're, if you're going to your family practice physician, you know, you know, we, you know, I'm in, I'm in Minneapolis. So if my family practice physician is, is located down the street from me and I'm going to the university of Minnesota, then I would have to ask my family practice physician to send my records up to the university of Minnesota, for example. And that way they can evaluate your charge. So then they would ask you to come in for an evaluation to discuss the study. You can ask all the questions you, you want. Your family can ask all the questions. And then after that, they might say, if you're in, are you still interested? So if that was the case, then you'd sign this, this document that I mentioned, the informed consent form. So they take you through that. It can be a long form. Uh, it has to be because it has to list as much as possible. And then you would sign that form to participate into the study, and after that, study procedures begin. This is gonna be a really silly question too, and this goes back to some of my, my real estate days as well as healthcare. Um, but a lot of times those uh, printed forms are really, really small. And when you're dealing with older adults, it's much appreciated if it's readable size <laughs> for them. Even though it takes more paper, it makes them feel much more comfortable that you understand them. Um, versus, you know, nine and 11 point font is just really tight. And I, and I know it's nice to be concise and have it in a package, but it does cause more stress for, for typically um, both the person with dementia and those that are with them because they're afraid they're gonna miss something, that it's tiny print because you don't want them to see something. There's kind of a psychology behind that. So I just thought I'd throw that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I'm going to do? I just made a note. I'm going to make sure our study team is is uh, is aware that you know the the, the print, the, the font size, and our documents are the right are the right size. But one thing that um, I, I want to mention to you: clinical research is a, has a lot of oversight, and I mentioned these um, these review boards at these at clinical at these institutions that do the studies. They're called IRBs, institutional review boards, and I can tell you that. They look out for things like that. If there's, if you, if you put all the good things in large font and all the bad things, the risk in small font, you know, they would make sure that that those things are listed sort of in equal measures. Mm -hmm. And um, and and we don't we don't want to. Nobody wants to list the the, the risk in, in in small in small font. And but I can assure you that there are lots of people along the way, your physician, your caregiver, the people involved in your care at the institutions, companies like ours, we take our responsibility seriously. There are lots of, lots of steps, FDA, there are lots of steps along the way to make sure the rights and welfare of patients who, who uh, participate in these trials are, are respected. Well, and I, I know earlier you had mentioned that when you, when you write that document up to you use kind of the people's language so that everything's not over their head, that they need to be able to comprehend um, what it is they're saying. And sometimes I know attorneys and, um, and, and researchers alike can use common language that they know inside and out, but the rest of us don't know. And so having it in explainable languages is very, very helpful um, you know, with that. Um, now, is that a form that they sign on their own that's sent out to them, or is it explained with somebody in front of them? Um, because the other thought is, especially with COVID right now, if somebody could be there to kind of step them through, even if it's going over a document via Zoom or a video explaining each area, maybe with common questions that they get on that, would also be, I think, um, helpful for people. And I know you, you can't change anything you're doing, you know, once you go through the process of the, the IBRS and stuff. But those are just things that I hear from people a lot in terms of concerns and trying to 
kind of mush through it all? So the institutions that we work with, it's, that's really very important too. And it, the, our philosophy and most of the institutions, if not all that we work with, feel that that's probably the most important part of, of the research process to make sure that it, it's, it's called informed consent mm -hmm. for a reason. So to make sure everybody understands what this protocol, what their research is all about, uh, how many, what, what happens at each follow-up visit, what are the potential benefits, what are the potential risks, who can you call if you have an issue, what are my obligations in the trial, how long is each visit going to last, all of that stuff is laid out, and it's always better to do that face-to-face -face if you can, or, or at the very least, having somebody there when you're reading it and, ask, and being able to uh, you know, answer questions for you. And we're seeing with COVID that you know, telemedicine has actually um, been a pretty reasonable way you know, to, to accomplish these goals. In fact, some of our study procedures can be done you know, on, on, a, on a Zoom call like we're doing here today. Now, not everybody is skilled at using Zoom. Not everybody has that, those capabilities at home and they may need help. But it is a, it is possible to you know to to conduct some of these you know consent visits either on Zoom or even on the phone, mm -hmm. and and many still are being done uh, you know being being done in the clinics face to face even with even with COVID. Now, um, speaking of COVID, uh, when somebody goes in for this surgery, can their care partner be there? I know with a lot of surgeries, you know they can't. And sometimes with a person with dementia, that can make a big difference in terms of their comfort level. And I know that you're talking with people more in a mild state um, that hopefully can comprehend what's going on and are part of the choice making process um, with this. Uh, but I'm just kind of curious if what the process is there or maybe each hospital is different too. Well. Every hospital has its own, um, you know, method of, of managing COVID and managing clinical studies within COVID. But, um, you know, to, to, to so, so patients, uh, the, you know, the, the people who are, you know, undergoing, putting their trust in, in the researchers and the company to have the procedure done, you know, it, it's not a trivial matter. And we think they need the support of caregivers all along the way mm -hmm. and family members all along the way. So, so the hospitals who are doing the procedure have provisions so that the, the, the subject patient's not left alone. So that when they, when they come out of the operating room, they, they see familiar faces um, when, they're, when, they can, when they can leave the recovery room. And, and the, the other thing I should mention is, you know, some of the study tests that um, we, we, we employ during the trial, we ask the caregiver, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're based on caregiver input as well. So the caregivers need, they also, the caregivers also sign a consent form that says, I can accompany the patient uh, on their study visits. So they're an integral part of the study without a, without a caregiver. That's actually an eligibility criterion that I probably didn't mention I should have, is that they have to have a reliable caregiver. It can be a spouse, can be a daughter, son, whatever, or a friend even, who, who, can, who can follow the patient's course of course, throughout the study, and it can, because they're asked questions a lot at the follow-up visits as well, and that turns into some of the data that we collect about the study and the outcome. I'm glad you brought that up, because I was going to ask, um, you know, if there was data that needed to be submitted from either the person and or the care partner, and is that something that they have to log on a daily basis, or is it just, you know, sent out, and they complete it on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, and... Um, how does that work? So there are there are three main tools that we're using, and these tools are, are focused on cognitive abilities and memory, mm -hmm. pretty obviously, right? And they're also focused on um, activities of daily living that that um, that we all undergo on a on a daily basis. And so these can be affected by dementia. So we want to try, we want to look at activities of daily living, as well as you know can can the subject the patient with with uh, with dementia, what's their memory like? Can they do? Can they? What what, what level of cognition and co cognitive function do they have? So there are tools that have been evaluated, um, been validated and evaluated in lots of different clinical trials that we're using. So when we do these, there's we do that we do those. As, 
I'll, I'll throw the names out here in case maybe somebody uh, listeners have heard of these. One is called the clinical dementia rating scale. Another one's called the ADAS COG, the Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Cognitive Subscale. It's a mouthful. That's why we call it the ADAS COG. Okay. In almost any large clinical trial you've ever heard of in Alzheimer's, one or two of those, one or both of those have been used in the trial. So we're using those. And um, one of those, and, and within, within in two of those, it does require input from the caregiver. So the caregiver provides, and then, it, then, and then they're scored. So those tests are done at, at what we call baseline before, before you start the study to establish the, that, that which we can compare results to. And then we pay, bring the patient back, back at six months and at 12 months and redo those tests. So then we compare those tests at six months and 12 months to see how they've changed since before the patient went into the trial. Okay. And then once the trial is over, what happens to the device? Does it get pulled or do they get to keep it? Or <laughs> That's a great, a really great question. We have it written down how that process should work. Mm -hmm. Now, if the patient decides, I'd rather not continue with the treatment for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and they agree with their doctor that it's the right thing to do, they can have the device removed. And that's a Simple surgery, simple. No surgery is simple, but it's a it's a surgical procedure that can be done in, the, in an ambulatory setting in about a half half an hour. From experience, in the first trial, we had 42 patients enrolled. Everybody chose to keep their stimulator um, on and running after the completion of the 12 months. But the options there. Okay. And then, uh, you know, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, like with a pacemaker, it's good for like 10 years. I just had a friend going, I got to go in and get a new battery. Um, is that the same thing with this that would occur then? It is. Okay. So the battery life of the technology that we're using is, is, is roughly three to five years. And mm -hmm. there is a range because the more power you use, the less the, less the, the battery life. Okay. So we say every three to five, you know, three to three to five years, and the procedure replace it. It's done in an, in, a, in a, what's called an ambulatory surgery center, an outpatient setting. You typically go in the morning, and you're out um, after a half an hour, forty five minute procedure uh, in the in the afternoon or late that morning. So it's a it's a it's a straightforward uh, replacement procedure, and it's done on a regular basis for for, for BBS systems. Okay. Now this is going to sound like a, a goofy question, but I'm always thinking out. So let's say somebody decides they're going to keep the device and they go in for this surgery. Would their own insurance cover that? Or is that looked at like an elective surgery then? So this is, uh, these are very insightful questions. And these, you know, <laughs> they, really, they really are because you're thinking of everything. The, um, so this is, um, this technology has been designated um, by, by CMS as um, technology that is covered by CMS because okay. it's technology that's already been used for another indication for Parkinson's. It's already been used for 150,000 patients. So if it's being used for a new indication in a clinical trial, CMS or Medicare covers the procedure and also future replacements. Okay. So the reimburse, so the patient doesn't have to, it's no longer elective at that point. If you need to have a replacement of your device, it's not elective. Okay. And once you're in the trial up front, it's you, but by the, by the fact we've, we've, uh, we've reviewed this with CMS before we started the trial and they've determined that yes, indeed it, co it, it qualifies for CMS coverage. Okay, so um, with the process, is that something, um, so for the initial cost, is that something you guys cover or is that something that goes through an individual's insurance? Yeah, it goes through their Medicare, so whatever, whoever their Medicare carriers, Medicare is covering okay. this. Okay, okay, yeah. I just wanted to be clear on that. No, it's, really, it's a really critical question, very important to, to right. answer that. Um, well, I. I think I've dug as deep as I can think regarding, <laughs> regarding everything, but it sounds really fascinating and um, very promising. So you're in the second trial. Um, how are, are you still looking for, for people, I would imagine? 
uh, for this trial or is it, you know, how far are you into the trial? And I know you guys have like a window usually for recruitment. Yeah, so we're, um, we're at the beginning, I would say the beginning of the trial. Our goal is to enroll roughly 200 patients into the trial. Okay. And it's a large number of patients, but it's very much small. Your typical all large Alzheimer's study might be 2,000 patients in the study or 1,000 patients per arm, the treatment arm and the control group. So our study is smaller because we're, we're expecting a, a large difference between the control group and the, and the treatment group. And so we don't need as many patients as those larger trials need. And that will be enough to secure um, FDA approval ultimately. And one thing we're excited about is, is the FDA, through an application process, um, designated this device, this DVS system, as a, as a breakthrough technology, meaning it has potential, if, if ultimately the trial is successful, it has a potential really to make a big impact on, on this particular disease, Alzheimer's. So we're excited about that. That was announced uh, uh, earlier this year, maybe the end of 2020. And um, so we're enrolling patients. We have roughly 15 sites in the United States, and these are large medical centers, institutions, uh, university institutions. I said we had one in Canada and several sites in Germany. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any, we're in, you and I are in Minnesota. We don't have a site in Minnesota, but. Um, yeah, how the heck that happened? <laughs> you know, I, Minnesota has a very strong uh, neurology and, and neurosurgery department and uh, lots of reasons. And Mayo, of course, Mayo too. Great neurosurgery, great DBS. Um, we just, uh, we just didn't, we didn't, they're on the list. So mm -hmm. we're sort of getting the, the sites who have all their paperwork done as quickly as possible after we go through the credentialing process, make sure they've got their, they've got a good dementia unit. They've got good neurosurgeons who have experience. And then it's a, it's a little bit of a bureaucratic process to get sites up and running. So they were just a little bit slower than, than the others so far. Okay. Well, sounds good. Um, I really, I, I appreciate you again, taking the time to explain this to us. And I do wanna mention that the um, advanced uh, trial, uh, advanced two trial is on Dementia Map as well. So you can, you can search for it there um, as well as going to their site. And the website is advanced study for, and the number four, um, ad.com or you can go to mildalzheimersstudy.com as well. You can also email them at info at fxneuro and then mod.com. And then of course you can always call and that number is 866-296-4040. And then you wanna press option one. So again, Todd, thank you so much for your time and what you're doing. I can't wait to hear the outcomes of the second trial here. And uh, we would love to see this be successful and get FDA approval, that's for sure. We need more options out there for people. Indeed we do, uh, indeed we do, Lori. Thank you very much for the time today, I really enjoyed it. Great, thank you. And for our listeners, I hope you like, click and share this. This is uh, good, valuable information, know that we need, you know, if, if we're going to find some cures for this, we need people to become candidates and participate in these trials. So check it out. It's, it's worth it, not just for you, but for those to come after you as well. So thank you. Bye now.